Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm kind of wondering how to start this talk off. Um, and I was advised that it's always best to start off from a place of truth. Um, so in that spirit of honesty, I'll guess, I guess I'll start off with my truth. And that is that sometimes, well, to be honest, a, a lot of the time when it comes to the web, uh, I actually have no idea what it is that we're doing. I have no idea what it is we think we're doing. And those moments of total confusion tend to hit me both as a designer and a user alike. So as a user, I find myself often confronted with this wide array of products, most of which are practically interchangeable, um, and, the, and neither of them um, really make much difference to the core uh, tasks that I'm trying to do with them. Um, and often, even when I do subscribe to any of these products, any of these services, I find myself quite literally afflicted by upgrades and changes that are poorly communicated and, quite frankly, don't seem to have any real benefit to myself um, and are definitely an example of feature creep, which concerns me as a designer because certainly on the local level, there's obviously the impact on the user's direct experience when we think about loading times. Um, and I'm also particularly concerned that this pleth these plethora of services often aren't much more usable than the other. They're certainly not particularly uh, accessible, especially when you consider in the context of the EU, you have about 26% um, of EU citizens who self-report that they live with some form of disability. Um, and certainly, these products aren't any more ethical, um, which again is a massive concern, especially when you're considering whether that's in, time, in terms of the amount of time and attention they demand from the user to the security of the user's information, even just to how they communicate what is connected um, by using the service, where the data is coming from, where the data is going. And when you put that in terms of the global context, you know, when you think of all these products and services which are taking up reams of server space, which has a huge environmental cost, if you think about the over 70 million servers which contribute, what, like 2% to all greenhouse emissions, not to speak of the impact of the production life cycle of the hardware on our environmental biological uh, ecosystems, as well as the poorest of the global population. And so in that spirit um, of fascination and confusion, fascination because like many of us here, um, I am someone who is genuinely excited and interested and fascinated by technologies. Um, I'm, I really want to take this opportunity to slightly provoke us as a community um, and start asking ourselves, firstly, um, what, what are we actually doing here? Um, and really to get into how are we doing it? So yeah, I'm sorry, but um, it's that time of the day. And what we're going to talk about is design. A bit of content warning. The next slide um, has some geometric uh, black and white animation. So, um, but I hopefully I won't linger on that too long. So, design. What is design? Well, when I'm for, for me in the context of this talk, I'm fundamentally talking about problem solving. So, when I talk about design and implicitly designers. Really, I'm talking about those of us who are creating something with an intent. So I'm as much speaking to those of us who are back-end engineers as I am for those who are API developers and user interface designers. To quote, if you're someone who moves things from an existing condition to a preferred one, you are a designer. And so if to design is to provoke movement, questions arise such as, well, where are we moving to? What are we moving from? And perhaps more importantly, what is it that we're actually moving? So if we look at this ecosystem, if we think about the things we are trying to move, one of the most obvious things um, is people. We're trying to move modes of behavior, ways of understanding, 
These are all conditions that we may well either be asked by our product owners, by ideators, by innovators to change, um, or they may well be things that we ourselves wish to move. And so often when we start trying to understand where people are in order to understand how we could potentially shift their behaviors and their ways of thinking, we tend to map out their experiences um, in this particular way. We tend to think about what they think and what they feel, um, what they say and what they hear, what they say and what they do. And by doing so, what we're trying to do is to get a sense of the complexity of the human, the complexity of the person who will be using our services and our technology. And I say complexity, and there's, in fact, a clue in the way I phrase the segments of the map, because often in reality what we find is that this is riddled with paradoxes. There are paradoxes between the way people think and, and how they feel between what they say and what they actually do, between the things they think they see or observe and the things that they actually act on and take note of. So here we have one way of trying to understand the humans that we are, as designers are trying to influence. But already there's a major pitfall that we're all susceptible to, and I suspect given the fascinatingly confusing state of things, we all too frequently give in to. Ultimately, what happens is that we tend to uh, limit the way that we're mapping these, our users, the way, we're limit, the way we um, imagine and understand our users, too much in terms of the problem that we think we're trying to solve. Ultimately, what that means is that we are inadequately framing the person who we think we're trying to serve. And ultimately, this is the source of the problem. Inadequate framing of the person leads to an inaccurate framing of the problem. Because ultimately, understanding people is meant to help us frame problems better to generate better outcomes. To quote, it's easy to make bad choices when there aren't many choices to begin with. And that is impacted by our inadequate framing of the person. Because ultimately, if the problem we think we're trying to solve is all there is to life, the universe, and everything, well, well, hang on, no, because it isn't. Ultimately, if our job is to move things into a preferred condition, it's vital to understand the current condition because humans don't just exist in relation to the problems that we think we're trying to solve. In fact, as humans, we exist in relation to many other interfering mental, mental and social models. We exist in relation to many other environments, natural, social, and built. And one of those built objects, one of those built environments, is the other object that we're trying to move over to a preferred condition. And that other object is the web. Now, at its most basic, um, the web is created by computational devices communicating with each other by an agreed protocol. But I've often been quite curious, because if you think about the map we use to try to uh, interrogate the experience of the human, what happens if we try to use that same map to understand the experience of the web? And often what happens is that in many ways we see that the same paradoxes apply. For all that the internet is created of communications between computers, sending bits of information between each other, Yet this information, regardless of the fact that it's broken down into its binary components, is nonetheless combined with the physical structure of the network, the physical structure that actually arises out of already existing, evolving geopolitical and economic structures. And it's that which contributes to some fundamental inequalities, such as which languages are more dominant, who has access to the web in the first place, when they do, and how. So to clarify, what's going on is that the inequalities we see on the web actually come from the material nature of the web. 
These inequalities that impact what people get to read, what they get to see, how secure their data might be, and indeed how safe they might be as a citizen of their country. And it's the materiality of the web, which is where, as designers, our concern for the environmental impact of the web should also come in. After all, all those servers are what helps to contribute to the fact that the web is the fourth largest um, producer of CO2 after the United States, China, and India. And so, if we go back to our analogy of design as dynamic, what you have are, is an object that's made up of a relationship between the human and the web. Where our solution, the thing that transmits movement to the system to move this relationship to a different way of being, actually becomes a part of the system. Ultimately, the intersection of the web, the user, and whatever additional dynamics we create will create, in turn, another emergent system. And like all emergent systems, it is complex in nature. It is chaotic and unpredictable. Arises into huge and often unseen uh, phase shifts, and sometimes it's often what results in cases like this. So this is a screenshot from um, a developer, Jackie Alcine, who was one of those who noticed the fact that uh, the, uh, the facial uh, recognition software that Google had um, initially put in place was incapable of realizing that black people were in fact human beings and instead categorized them as gorillas. And I always point to this example partly because it's pretty famous and, and most people have at least had heard an inkling of it. But I think in terms of what I'm trying to talk about, in terms of designing for this human and web system, it highlights some of the key assumptions that we tend to infect our solutions with. It highlights assumptions about what aspects of the human need to be taken into consideration. And particularly in the case of this example, highlights our assumptions about our ability to manage and solve any resultant errors in the service we think we provi we're providing. Seeing this kind of stuff is fascinating for me as a user experience designer, because it's enough to make any, anyone cry, like, <laughs> do you even design? But really, a lot of what's happening is that we are too busy framing our design research into how it directly applies to the problem we want to solve. We're ignoring the noise because it doesn't seem to be relevant. And this is something that I myself am totally susceptible to. I'm from the UK, a society that's still massively riven by class um, and racial inequalities. And even I sometimes will fall prey to this. I have to remember that actually, for myself, as a middle class, cisgendered, university educated, abled citizen of a first world Anglophone nation, that so much of what I might perceive as just additional and extra bits of information, essentially the noise in my research data, is not, in fact, noise. What's going on is simply my relative privilege impeding my ability to interpret the data. It's not noise. It's just your privilege talking. The designed object, after all, is a revelatory object. It reveals our assumptions about people, our assumptions about how we think the world works, or indeed how we think it doesn't. It certainly isn't neutral. And as a child of humanity, technology can never be neutral. So when we're designing things that will be used by people, we need to check how we think about people and how we think about the world. We all, after all, have multiple facets to ourselves and as to how we're seen by society. So the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, for example, who uh, invented the term intersectionality, that work actually came out of rigorous analysis about the way United, legislation in the United States at the time couldn't fully account for the discriminatory experience faced by black women in the workplace. Because as people who were both black 
and women, the legal system couldn't adequately frame their experience being a combination of sexism and racism. And so similarly, like that legal system, our technologies may not be able to adequately frame the experiences of our users and could, as a result, put them at risk from the inequality that they already interface with in their society, and in fact that our technologies will in turn interface and be impacted by. It's not noise, it's just your privilege talking. So, I promise that this would also have something that's a bit practical. Um, so I guess now the most obvious question is, okay, well, hey you, teaching us how to design, what can we try instead? So firstly, what I always um, like to say is, well, first I'll start by reaching out and opening up. Reach out. Get your technology looked at. Get your technology considered from a different perspective. If you're living in a university city or nearby a research in institute, find out who your local digital humanities academics are. Get in touch with ethnographers and social historians who will have experience in analyzing hundreds of years' worth of data concerning human behavior and the interaction with technology. If your city has an impact hub or a maker space, reach out to them and get them involved in critiquing, ideating, and testing your technologies, the solutions that you think might help them. Working in machine learning? Well, join the Algorithmic Justice League to help you query that training data, or at least to raise concerns that you might have about how well the data, has been, has, the data set has been formulated. If you're already in development phase or think about pushing upgrades, use gamified interventions like the tarot cards of tech to help you design and improve architecture that is flexible enough to handle the various situations that even a single persona can find themselves in. And even if it's almost too late to, uh, to bring in those kind of changes to your ways of working, at the very least, it will help you be honest about where the potential security and social risks for users will be. The next tip I give is to design your technology as a service. And what does that mean? Well, what it means, to paraphrase the service design network, um, is that Think about how you're designing the infrastructure, the communication between the different levels of your system, and the material components of the service will interact not just with the people who are using the service, but also with the service provider. Your solution is in many ways a go-between between, between two already existing complex systems. Design the whole life cycle. Design what happens when it breaks. Design what happens when it degrades. Design how people will deal with it if they have issues with it. What happens if one of your users dies? What happens to their data then? Design, design, think about this. The other thing that might also be helpful as a kind of a fun little exercise, actually map out the experience of your solution as though it were a person. And I'm honestly not trying to be cute actually pin down how is it that your solution thinks? How does it feel? What does it think about its users? What is the mental model of your technology? What can it understand about people? Are they just first name and last name? Do they use social media? Can it see what other data, what other things the user transmit across the vast, vast ecosystem of the web? What does your technology see and hear from other services and other technologies? Most importantly, I would, I would advise you to remember and to understand the person, the human being, as multidimensional. And remember that complexity in any complex system comes from the most basic component. The variations that exist within that system are often what lead to wide divergences in behaviors um, and phases. And, then, and for us, as designers of the web, that complexity comes from the human. So think about how their context informs even their non-task-related needs. 
Is it always safe for them to use social media logins to gain access to your service? And if they have done, can they, are they empowered to change what information is displayed? One of the things that always, frankly, annoys me quite significantly is if I'm, using, if I'm logging into a solution and I can, for example, use my Twitter handle to log in, and yet, I can't change the image. I can't change it into, say, um, a generic avatar in case I don't actually want people to realize that it's the same person on Twitter and, or Meetup or wherever else who's also using this particular product. So what are the issues? Well, how do they report if something goes wrong with the, with the solution, either in terms of the other users they're encountering or with the solution itself? Can you build this at scale? Always consider how your solution will be used in the context of the other, someone as different from you as possible. Consider how your tech might be used by or impact someone who is homeless, someone who is a refugee, someone who is a woman, someone who is trans, someone with varying power supply in their local context. And if it seems tokenistic, well, to be honest, that says more about your technology than the design process. If considering the multiplicity of human experience comes across as tokenistic, quite frankly, that's because your technology is already objectifying people. So check yourself. Do people actually need the service that you think you're providing? If you are truly convinced that people do, then I'm afraid you need to be ready to get uncomfortable and start engaging with the realities of human existence. A really great way, then, to uh, account for this complexity is what often gets called design jamming. And you know the famous saying how it goes, if you can't beat them, involve them. Even before user acceptance testing, get into the habit of co-creating, doing design jams with users, your testers, and your auditors. What you will end up with are technologies that are much more resilient and have a more durable end-to-end -end service, because instead of having to react to the complexity once they are out there in the ecosystem, they have already imbibed that complexity as part of the basic architecture of the product. And if you need help, and you may well do, and that's fine, there's a huge service design network out there that's filled with friendly and really excited service and user experience designers who are itching to help you design the technologies of the future, which can still be human-centered, ethical, and accessible. By 2020, it's estimated there will be 200 billion device, connected devices exchanging zettabytes worth of data. And yet, if the foundational technologies that help us analyze and extract value from this data to create our products, if those foundational technologies are built in hope rather than on the evidence about our intersectional realities, that means we create an ever greater pile up of digital gunk that no one really needs, increases our already massive environmental deficit, and puts us all at increased risk from cyber and social political attacks. I implore you, therefore, as a fellow designer, think broader than your problem, think broader than your screens, think broader than your personas, think broader than your neat little plugins. Think broader, make inclusively, and start designing better. Thank you.